Back in the fall of 2017 as an undergraduate of Brown University, I took a graduate level course in quantum chemistry. And the first problem of the first problem set homework assignment about the Dirac delta function still puzzled me even long after I had completed the course, and I'm going to attempt to explain how to do this problem in this video. Little did I know that this problem delves into the fundamental notions of even more advanced math classes that I still have not taken, in topics such as real analysis, functional analysis, and topology, far beyond the scope of what would be covered in the chemistry department at Brown. As an engineer and a musician, I probably will never use, learn, or care about these topics, but it is still fascinating to ponder nonetheless. So the Dirac Delta function is extremely important in many fields of applied math, science, and engineering, particularly useful in the subfields of signal processing and electrical engineering, quantum and statistical mechanics in chemistry and physics, probability theory and differential equations in applied mathematics, and electrodynamics and physics as well. But what I personally find fascinating is all the different ways one can represent the Dirac Delta function, which is what I will be talking about in this video. Let's start off with the square as so, with unit area. Now we're going to keep squeezing the square or shrinking it in the horizontal direction while stretching it or expanding the square in the vertical direction to make sure we have a very thin but tall rectangle with an area of 1. As with the previous squeezing the square example, one can see that eventually we end up with a function that is basically zero everywhere, except at the origin, where the value is infinity, which electrical engineers represent with an upwards arrow of unit length to show that this generalized function has a total area of 1. Here is Paul Dirac, the physicist after whom the Dirac delta function is named. Let's start off with a triangle as so with unit area. Now we're going to keep squeezing the triangle or shrinking it in the horizontal direction while stretching it or expanding the triangle in the vertical direction to make sure we have a very thin but tall triangle with an area of 1. Notice how once again the sequence approaches the Dirac delta generalized function in the limit. So here I'm going to explain how function transformations work using mathematical notation. So if you have a function f of x and you stick in a factor of a inside f of x to become f of ax, you have essentially squeezed or shrunk the function horizontally by a factor of a. This is geometrically seen as follows. Here we have a picture of me, and here we have squeezed or shrunk the function horizontally by a factor of 2. Notice how the area is now cut in half after this transformation. The reason why this transformation happens is because essentially function f is now cycling through all the inputs of x at an accelerated rate of a times x, so the outputs get sent out at an accelerated rate as well. This is easily seen through a sinusoid sine wave. Notice how the sinusoid sine wave oscillates at a faster rate. This is called the frequency of the sine wave. When the input of the function goes through at a faster rate, the output of the function naturally gets sent out at a faster rate, and thus everything appears to be squeezed or shrunk in the horizontal direction. Notice how the frequency is how fast the sine wave oscillates or cycles through its period in a given amount of length. So here I'm going to continue to explain how function transformations work using mathematical notation. So if you have a function f of x, and you stick in a factor of a outside of f of x to become a f of x, you have essentially stretched or expanded the function in the vertical direction by a factor of a. This is geometrically seen as follows. Here we have a picture of me again, and here we have stretched or expanded the function vertically by a factor of 2. Notice how the area is now doubled after this transformation. This can also be seen with a sinusoidal sine wave. Notice how one of the sine waves is twice as tall as the other sine wave. This is called the amplitude of the sine wave. The bigger sine wave is formed by taking the smaller sine wave and stretching or expanding it in the vertical direction by a factor of 2. This makes intuitive sense. By scaling each output point of a function by a specific factor, the entire function ends up looking vertically stretched by that specific factor. The concept of stretching and shrinking functions in a specific dimension or direction will become extremely pertinent in my further explanations. So compact support in mathematical terms describes a function that is zero everywhere outside a specific region. The triangle function and the boxcar function as previously shown are examples of functions with compact support. Outside of the triangle or the square, the function is zero everywhere. It seems pretty apparent that if you take any function with compact support and continuously shrink or squeeze it in the horizontal direction by the same factor as you stretch or expand it simultaneously in the vertical direction to keep its area constant under transformation, you will arrive at a Dirac delta function eventually in the limit. So the tricky question that came about in this quantum chemistry problem set is, what if your function does not have compact support? Does it still approach a Dirac delta function in the limit? If so, why? Let's talk about B, the Gaussian kernel first, because this makes the most intuitive sense of the three kernels shown previously. So the problem takes the limit as epsilon approaches zero, but I'm going to rewrite the problem in an equivalent and easier to understand expression, where epsilon approaches infinity instead. I'm also going to remove normalization constants to avoid distraction from the main idea. Notice how the transformations I recently talked about now come into play. 
The original form Gaussian is being stretched in the vertical direction by a factor of epsilon and being shrunk in the horizontal direction by a factor of epsilon. A Gaussian or a normal distribution never equals zero and thus cannot have compact support. However, the farther away from the middle you go, the closer the output goes to zero, and it decays at over an exponential rate the farther away from zero you go. So essentially, the higher the magnitude of the input to the Gaussian, the closer to zero the output of the Gaussian approaches, and it approaches zero extremely quickly at a decaying greater than exponential rate. The total area under the Gaussian is indeed finite. This can be shown in a number of ways using multivariable calculus. One way is converting to cylindrical polar coordinates and using the appropriate volume element found by using the Jacobian determinant or by multiplying the Lemay metric coefficients. Another way is using Feynman's famous differentiation of the integral technique, alluded to in the chapter A Different Box of Tools of his book. This is really just an application of Leibniz's rule to solve particularly tricky and difficult integrals. Instead, I will just plug into Wolfram Alpha and screenshot the result. So what happens to the Gaussian under these transformations and in the limit? Notice how the Gaussian hill keeps getting thinner and thinner yet taller and taller in the limit as epsilon approaches infinity. Also notice how each Gaussian hill has the same area. This clearly graphically represents how this Gaussian can be used to make a delta function. Another really important thing to notice here is that in the limit as epsilon approaches infinity, the resulting function is zero basically everywhere except at the origin. The normal distribution becomes so squeezed that all of its mass basically ends up being concentrated right at the middle. In the limit as epsilon approaches infinity, pretty much every point besides the origin in this function approaches zero at an extremely fast rate. The Gaussian function already decreases to zero at a decaying exponential rate, which is further amplified by the infinite horizontal squeezing happening as epsilon approaches infinity. Now let's take a look at the Lorentzian example. This is quite similar to the Gaussian example. First, ignoring normalization constants, let's put the Lorentzian in an easier form to work with, and we get this result. As you can see from this form, we are taking the Lorentzian and stretching it vertically by a factor of epsilon, and squeezing it horizontally by a factor of epsilon. From a qualitative standpoint, the Lorentzian does look very similar to a Gaussian. Just like the Gaussian, the Lorentzian never equals zero and thus cannot have compact support. However, the farther away from the middle you go, the closer the output goes to zero, and it decays at a polynomial or distance squared rate the farther away from zero you go. So essentially, the higher the magnitude of the input to the Lorentzian, the closer to zero the output of the Lorentzian approaches, and it approaches zero quite quickly at a polynomial or distance squared rate. The Lorentzian does indeed have finite total area. Finding this area involves recognizing the integral of 1 over x squared plus 1 is the arctangent function. To derive this, one must use implicit differentiation and trigonometric identities. I'm just going to plug this into Wolfram Alpha and show you the result. So what happens to the Lorentzian under these transformations and in the limit? Notice how the Lorentzian hill keeps getting thinner and thinner yet taller and taller in the limit as epsilon approaches infinity. Also notice how each Lorentzian hill has the same area. This clearly graphically represents how this Lorentzian can be used to make a delta function. Another really important thing to notice here is that in the limit as epsilon approaches infinity, the resulting function is zero basically everywhere except at the origin. The Lorentzian becomes so squeezed that all of its mass basically ends up being concentrated right at the middle. In the limit as epsilon approaches infinity, pretty much every point besides the origin in this function approaches zero at quite a rapid rate. The Lorentzian function already decreases to zero at a decaying polynomial or distance squared rate, which is further amplified by the infinite horizontal squeezing happening as epsilon approaches infinity. So here comes the real tricky question. What happens with the sinc function? This is way less obvious than the previous Gaussian and Lorentzian cases. First, let's rewrite the sinc function into something that's easier to analyze and interpret. The problem provides a sinc squared, but the problem remains the same even with a normal sinc that is not squared, and it is easy to see this after the fact. Ignoring normalization constants, we get this result. Let's first analyze the sinc that is not squared, and here is the result that we get. As you can see from this form, we are taking the sinc function and stretching it vertically by a factor of epsilon, and squeezing it horizontally by a factor of epsilon. This is the exact same process that we did with the Gaussian and the Lorentzian to create a delta function. Now let's plot this and see what happens. Here's what the original sinc function looks like. Now let's keep stretching it vertically while shrinking it horizontally to see what happens. So yes, we can clearly see that at the origin the function shoots up to infinity, but something is not quite right. Let's zoom in a bit. In digital signal processing, we often talk about side lobes, especially when designing filters. Notice how in the sinc function graphed here, the main lobe has a peak height of 1. The first side lobe has a peak height of about 0.2 as calculated below. 
Therefore, the main lobe will always be about five times taller than the first side lobe no matter how we transform the sync function. Here is the problem. No matter how large we make epsilon, graphically we can clearly see that this function is not zero everywhere else besides the origin, and furthermore, this function does not even approach zero everywhere besides the origin as we increase epsilon toward infinity. Mathematically, we can see this result using some electrical engineering knowledge as well. So it is common in electrical and radio engineering to send information using radio waves using amplitude modulated signals, thus formulating the concept of AM radio, where the AM stands for amplitude modulation. To perform amplitude modulation, you start out with a carrier wave sinusoid of a really high frequency, and you multiply it by the signal containing information you want to send, and thus the signal containing information you want to send multiplies the carrier wave sinusoid and modulates the temporary and instantaneous amplitude of the carrier wave sinusoid, hence the name. This is best illustrated using this image, linked to image source on the bottom. Notice how we clearly have a carrier wave sinusoid of high frequency that is multiplied or amplitude modulated by the modulating waveform or message signal with information that we want to send. Notice how the envelope highlighted in blue clearly represents the modulating waveform. The idea of the envelope is the easiest way to grasp and understand the concept of amplitude modulation. Essentially, the modulating waveform creates the envelope under multiplication with the carrier. Similarly, the transformed sync function can be viewed with the perspective of amplitude modulation. We can rewrite the previous result as follows. We can then interpret this result using amplitude modulation. We can interpret the sine wave as the carrier wave, and we can interpret the 1 over x as the modulating signal or envelope generator. Reminder, we are taking the limit as epsilon becomes very large and approaches infinity, and therefore it is safe to say that our sinusoidal carrier wave is of a really high frequency, as it should be for proper amplitude modulation. Graphically, we can clearly see how amplitude modulation is happening. Clearly, the 1 over x generates the envelope that amplitude modulates the carrier wave. Thus, this creates a huge conundrum. If we increase epsilon, all we do is increase our carrier wave frequency, but no matter how fast or high our carrier wave frequency is, the envelope of 1 over x will always remain the same. Thus, clearly in the limit as epsilon approaches infinity, this function does not actually approach zero everywhere besides at the origin. So how could this function possibly be used to represent a delta function? Let's delve into some deeper math ideas. Here is the Heaviside step function. It is zero when x is less than zero, and it is one when x is greater than zero. From the graph, it can be seen why they called this a step function. Oliver Heaviside was a famous electrical engineer after whom this function was named. Random note, some people consider the Heaviside step function the integral of the Dirac delta function, and therefore the Dirac delta function is the distributional derivative of the Heaviside step function. So here's the real question. What happens when x equals zero? Is it zero? Is it one? Is it 57? Then again, does it really matter? After all, no matter how we define the output of that one specific point of the Heaviside step function, we still just end up using it the same way in all electrical engineering applications. Fun fact, we spent like a whole week debating this issue in Engine 1570, Linear System Analysis, or Signals and Systems at other schools. Okay, let's look at another example. So here, this function looks exactly like the line y equals x, However, there is a hole or removable singularity at x equals 3 because the output of the function is undefined at x equals 3. So here's the question, how should we define this one specific point? Should we just define that hole as 3 as to make the function smooth and continuous? But then again, what's stopping us from making the hole like 57 or something? Let's look at a further example. Consider the boxcar function again. I introduced this function in the beginning because clearly this function has a total area of 1. The question is, how do we define the discontinuous points at x equals 0 0.5 and x equals negative 0 0.5? Should they be 0? Should they be 1? Should they be 57? Then again, does it really matter? No matter where we put these two very specific points, looking at the function as a whole, it still has the same total area of 1. A function contains an infinite set of points, and moving just two specific individual points of the infinite set doesn't really change it that much. This idea can be seen in the example of the Gibbs phenomenon of Fourier series. Notice how the Fourier approximation of the square wave overshoots the discontinuity point. However, mathematically the Fourier series still converges globally despite having an overshoot at just one point. Here is a picture of a square wave approximated with 125 harmonics. So the real question is, since a function has an infinite set of output points, how many specific individual points must one change before the function can basically be classified or considered as a different function? One, two, seven, a million? 
What about a smaller but still countably infinite subset of the domain of the entire function? The thing is, if we keep going, eventually we'll end up altering every point of the function itself to be an entirely different function altogether. So there is a metaphorical line that one will eventually cross to answer that question. These are the kinds of questions they ask in advanced math classes, and my communications systems professor in Engine 1580 showed us this idea and refused to delve into it further because it was beyond the scope of an engineering class. One of my pure math friends at Brown had a Russian math professor who said in his thick Russian accent, Class, these are what I call engineering integrals. They're so easy that even engineers can do them. So back to the sink function. Important note about the total area. The sink function does have finite total area. This can easily be shown with the following methods. One can perform the sink integral by using Feynman's differentiation under the integral sign technique, the famous technique referred to in the chapter A Different Box of Tools in his book. This is essentially just a specific and situational application of Leibniz's rule. One can also perform the sink integral by using Fourier transform pairs. This is so interesting and short that I'll quickly demonstrate this after going through this list. One could also even use the alternating series test to show that the area converges. Basically approximate the sink integral with the alternating harmonic series to show that there is finite area. One can also show the sink function has finite energy using Parseval's relation, and therefore should have finite total area. One can also calculate the sink integral using complex analysis by using the Cauchy residue theorem and the contour integration around the poles. I'm just going to attach the Wolfram Alpha screenshot. So here's how you calculate the sink integral using Fourier transform pairs. Later in the video, I will prove this result pictured here. Using this result, you can see the red boxcar function is equal to the integral below. Now if we set omega equal to zero, we end up getting the sink integral. On the red boxcar function, when omega equals zero, our function equals one, giving us our answer to the sink integral. Now we can go back to the limit of the sink. We do know one point for sure, when x equals zero using Opital's rule. Note, mathematicians will get mad at me for this, but for the sake of simplicity to not get bogged down in the minute details, I'm just going to say that infinity times zero is zero, and cosine of zero is one. Also, we can clearly see from the graph that the limit approaches infinity when x equals zero and epsilon gets larger. In the limit as epsilon approaches infinity, because a sinusoid is periodic, there is an infinite set of points where the output of the function is zero. I have indicated examples of where these points would lie with the little yellow dots. The thing is, there is also another infinite set of points where the function output value is not zero. I have indicated examples of where these points would lie with dots of a different color, red. So now we get back to the philosophical question. This limit of the sink at the origin does indeed approach infinity as epsilon approaches infinity. However, it does not exactly equal zero everywhere else besides the origin because as shown there are an infinite set of points that are not zero. This can easily be seen from the envelope. We could philosophically debate forever until the cows come home about how many points or what percentage of points do two functions need to have identical to be considered the same function. So perhaps we should rephrase the question. Does this limit involving the sink act in the same way as a Dirac delta function? Arguably, the most important property of the Dirac delta function is that all of its finite mass or area is indeed concentrated at one point at the origin. So perhaps we should see if that is also the case with the sink limit. It is indeed true that the limit involving the sink does have all of its mass or area concentrated at the origin in the middle. Let's first go back to transformations. Let's say you have a rectangle with base of length b and height of length h. Let's say you elongate the height of the rectangle by a factor of y, and you shrink the base of the rectangle by a factor of x. Suppose your original area was hb. Now your new area is hb y over x. Now suppose we set both x and y equal to a factor epsilon then your new area is going to be hb epsilon over epsilon equals hb, meaning your new area will remain unchanged under transformation. This generalizes to all shapes besides rectangles, because if you use calculus philosophy, any function or shape can be represented by an infinite amount of infinitesimally small rectangles, and since areas add linearly, scaling works the same way for all shapes. This is exactly what is happening with the limit involving the sink. If you shrink one dimension by the same factor as you stretch another dimension, they end up canceling out and leaving the area unaltered. Using this logic, let's look at the main lobe and side lobes of the sink function and do some numerical examples. The main lobe of the sink function has this area. The first side lobe of the sink function has this area. The second side lobe of the sink function has this area. The third side lobe of the sink function has this area. The fourth side lobe of the sink function has this area. Notice how the absolute value of the area of each side lobe decreases and gets smaller the farther away you get from the origin. 
This makes sense if we look back at the amplitude modulation example. The sine wave is periodic, but with the envelope of 1 over x amplitude modulating the carrier sinusoid, each lobe's peak height will decrease by a factor of 1 over x. If we approximate each lobe with a rectangle the width of a half period of the sinusoid frequency and with the height of the peak of each lobe as shown on the right, the area of each approximated lobe will still decrease by a factor of basically 1 over side lobe number from the origin because of the red envelope. Note that this approximation will always overshoot the absolute value of the area of the lobe, as can be seen graphically. It is worth noting that no matter how we stretch, shrink, scale, or transform the sink function, the ratio of the areas of the lobes and the ratio of the heights of the peaks of the lobes will remain constant. As was just shown numerically and analytically, each lobe decreases in area and peak height the farther away one goes from the origin. Furthermore, as shown earlier, the sink function has a finite amount of total area, and therefore we can conclude that if we continually squeeze the sink function horizontally, every single lobe that contributes to the finite total area gets squeezed towards the center, and lots of lobes start to concentrate and get compacted in the middle. Intuitively, the lobes with the largest area and contribution to the finite total area get concentrated towards the center, and when you look farther away from the center, you start to look at lobes that contribute less significantly to the finite total area, because they get progressively smaller the farther away you go. Therefore, to conclude more generally, since the side lobe areas decrease with side lobe number by a factor of about 1 over side lobe number, and since the sink has finite total area, logically we can conclude that the lower the side lobe number, the more significant that side lobe is in its contribution to the total area, and the closer to the center it is. And vice versa, the higher the side lobe number, the less significant that side lobe is in its contribution to the total area, and the farther away from the center it is. I will go into this in more detail. So here's a question. In the limit as epsilon goes to infinity, what happens if we arbitrarily pick a side lobe, let's say, here, indicated by the green circle? Let's approximate the green lobe by a rectangle with a base width of pi over epsilon, or half a period, and with a height of the peak value of the green lobe, which will lie on the red envelope line. As mentioned earlier, the area of this will overshoot the actual area. So the thing is, the green lobe's height will be finite since it lies on the red line, which we can clearly see, but the green lobe's width will be pi over epsilon, where epsilon approaches infinity. Finite height times infinitesimal width is still zero area. Therefore, the green lobe has zero area in the limit. Okay, so what if we call that green lobe we just previously chose the nth side lobe, and we decide to pick a side lobe that is closer to the origin, indicated by the yellow circle? Why don't we divide n over 2 and round up and call this number m? Well, the nth lobe also has zero area by similar logic and reasoning. The thing is, in the limit as epsilon goes to infinity, there are an infinite number of earlier side lobes before we get to the nth side lobe, or even the nth side lobe, for that matter. Infinity divided by 2 is still infinity. Since n over 2 equals m equals infinity, and side lobe area basically decreases by 1 over side lobe number, the nth side lobe has zero area in the limit as well as the nth side lobe. With this logic, if there are an infinite number of side lobes before we get to any specific arbitrary nth or mth lobe, and the side lobe area is decreased by a factor of basically 1 over side lobe number, then if we keep setting m as our new n, and repeat the iterative process and try to get progressively closer to the center, essentially we will end up continuously repeating the process forever, since we will never get through an infinite number of side lobes, even if we keep dividing by 2 over and over and over again. No matter how many times we repeatedly divide n equals infinity by 2, we will still always get an infinite result. This sort of draws analogous parallels from Zeno's paradox. In the limit as epsilon approaches infinity, no matter how many iterations we perform, n and m are always infinite because there are always an infinite number of preceding side lobes no matter where on the graph we arbitrarily pick and place our initial green and yellow circle initially. Let's examine this logic further. Let's say I pick the side lobe that corresponds to the point x equals 0.01. The side lobe at x equals 0.01 has zero area in the limit from the previous logic. Let's say we get closer to the origin and pick the side lobe at x equals 0.001. The side lobe at x equals 0.001 also has zero area in the limit from the previous logic. We can keep picking points that get closer and closer to the origin, but as with Zeno's paradox, until we actually exactly reach the origin destination, movement is impossible, and likewise, until we get to exactly the origin, we will have zero area for the side lobes. Abiding by the fact that there is a finite amount of total area of the sink even in the limit, once we get to the origin, 
all of the unused mass or area must be concentrated right there at the origin because everywhere else that is not the origin must have zero area or mass. To summarize, the previous logic showed that everywhere apart from the origin has zero area because 1. The side lobes that are not at the origin have finite height but infinitesimal width and therefore have zero area. And 2. Unless you look directly at the origin, there are always an infinite number of preceding side lobes no matter where you look. Side lobe area is decreased by a factor of 1 over side lobe number, which is why it is important there are an infinite number of preceding side lobes. Furthermore, essentially this logic proves that all of the mass or area of this function is indeed concentrated at the origin. At the origin, the lobes have basically infinite height, and even with infinitesimal width, this ends up putting all of the total finite mass and area of the sink function at the origin in the limit as epsilon approaches infinity. Note. Who knows just how many lobes are actually concentrated in just that one point at the origin? I haven't taken topology, so I don't know the detailed answer. Therefore, one can conclude that the limit involving the sink may not actually converge to a Dirac delta function, but it does at least have the same properties of a Dirac delta function, that is, 1. All of its mass or area is indeed concentrated at the origin, and 2. The function has zero mass or area everywhere else besides the origin. So returning to the sink squared, I know lots of mathematicians are going to get mad at me for doing this. Since infinity squared over infinity is basically just one infinity, we basically arrive at a Dirac delta function in the end, right? QED. One of the important and essential properties of the Dirac delta function is the sifting property, as talked about in Engine 1570, Linear System Analysis, or Signals and Systems at other schools. Here is the sifting property. When you take the inner product of a delta function and another function, we end up sifting out or getting the value of the function at that point the delta function was at. Electrical engineers define the impulse response of a linear time invariant system by utilizing the convolution operation and the sifting property of the delta function. By definition, when one sends an impulse or Dirac delta function into a system H, one gets back the impulse response H of t. The star denotes the mathematical operation of convolution, and the fancy f denotes the Fourier transform operation. Now by the convolution theorem, convolution in time domain is multiplication in the frequency domain. Combining with the previous equations, we get this. With this information, we can conclude that the Fourier transform of a delta function must be the multiplicative identity, 1. Therefore, the Dirac delta function in 1 must be a Fourier transform pair. So how does the sink function relate to all of this? So the sink and the boxcar function are a Fourier transform pair. Let's quickly show this using the following steps. Therefore, here's the Fourier transform pair derived. So what happens in the limit as a approaches infinity? Well, our boxcar function will become longer and longer and longer, eventually becoming a constant function of 1. As we learned from previously, our sink will also become a delta function, but the point of using the Fourier analysis is to provide a further justification for why in the limit the sink does indeed approach a delta function. Remember how we said that the delta function in 1 must be a Fourier transform pair by definition? Well, in the limit as a approaches infinity, the boxcar function approaches 1, and therefore its Fourier transform pair that is a sink function must indeed approach a delta function. Fun side note, the delta function and the infinite boxcar function equals 1 both obey Parseval's relation as follows. In conclusion, I hope I could provide some further insights into some deep and esoteric math ideas, and hopefully people can acquire a grasp on the tricky and various forms of the nascent Dirac delta function, which basically expresses the Dirac delta function as a limit, as you have now seen. This whole journey started with my observation of a particularly tricky conundrum in my quantum chemistry problem set, and after much thought and pondering, I have gleaned some insights to be able to share. Math is a central subject to all fields in STEM, and it is truly a fascinating pursuit. I may not be the best mathematician, engineer, or even musician, but I hope I can share my passion and that my words and ideas can inspire others to think, ponder, and explore these fascinating realms of human knowledge.